hello you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Stetargus, gosh, Honey Stoker. Now then, I am incredibly eager to get straight into things. Taking a look here, it is the 28th of Obsidian 298, late winter, and we just got through enjoying a nice autumn festival. But that doesn't seem to matter to quite a few of the fortress's dwarves. As you can see, many of them are still extremely upset. And they can't totally be blamed either. You may remember that just a year ago we were attacked by Jilasum, the Titan, who we were able to kill, but not without taking significant losses. Nine dwarves. And we also lost Iron Tongue, our bookkeeper and longtime fortress resident. On top of that, we did encounter a siege as well, very unfortunate, and also added a bit more trauma. Oof, yeah, not feeling too great about it. But we have been taking some measures recently to try to get the dwarves to be a little happier. Now, up till this point, all of the dwarves in the fortress have been part of the military. Every single one. Which hasn't really worked out too well. It's nice to have a bunch of warriors around, but if those warriors are going to be poorly equipped and are also going to panic in combat situations, then we have to fix something. Things cannot continue like this. And so I thought it best if we tried to refine the military a tad. We are supposed to be a fortress of warrior vampires after all. And so if you have a look here, you can see I've disbanded all of our squads. Every single one and now we have only this single squad. That being the Boar Bloods, who are 10 of our most combat hardened and level headed dwarves in the fortress. A few of whom were extremely eager to join, but some of which had to be uh, conscripted, unfortunately. Now, their ranks include Bembol, who is and has been the leader of our military for a little bit now. He's a good leader, but as you see up here, he is not an axe dwarf, and he currently is equipped with an axe. That being Usprausnem, an artifact iron axe that was forged long ago in the depths of the Larval Castle, home of Gugo Usburial, Demon King of the Goblins. From there it was stolen by the humans, and then was in turn stolen by Moses, and then given to us. I figured that would be a suitable weapon for the guy. And we also have him equipped with some better gear as well. Iron and steel. We don't have much steel equipment, or even iron equipment for that matter, but those goblins did drop a lot of iron gear during that last siege. And so we're getting that melted down and we're going to craft as much iron armor as we can. No more of that copper crap. Sick of it. On top of that, you can see he's also equipped with Mengakith Rulutat, as well as Lolak Metal. Our Honey Stoker made artifact black bronze helmet and breastplate. I figured that would be suitable and extremely awesome. Bemble has also gained the new title, Lord Protector. Moving on, next up in the squad we have Lore, a dwarf who's been around the place for a while now, a few years anyways, and Lore has the title of Lord Tactician, because he is our fortress's best tactician at the moment. And if we're going to go out and attack those goblins, which I'm hoping to do very shortly, then we'll certainly need to have him part of the team. Lore is equipped with iron gear, of which he only has a couple of pieces at the moment, because unfortunately he was the last one to join the squad and had to kind of pick over the scraps. <laughs> but also he's equipped with Odam Thilseg, which is the artifact steel battle axe that was crafted by Cole Ukakal. Not something that Cole was too eager to give up, by the way. But fortress orders, we have to do this for survival. Moving on, beneath lore we also have these four dwarves here, Kogan, Kubuk, Dumad, and Urist, dwarves we have not been properly introduced to yet, but who I'm sure we'll get to know in time. They are all equipped with iron armor and steel weapons by the way. But then beneath those guys we do have some faces that we are acquainted with, including Maful Obadgashad, who was our fortress's prime engraver, but he's also a professional spear dwarf, and so he was conscripted. And we also have Id Yuristvathsith, a high master spear dwarf, and actually probably our best fighter in the entire fortress. And we also have Zafan, a former beekeeper and then messenger, a fortress favorite. And last but not least, we have Moldy. One of Moses' greatest admirers and a dwarf who was a catalyst in turning our entire fortress into vampires. Yes, these 10 dwarves here are equipped with our very best, and I'm going to set them to training and they're going to train most of the time, I'm thinking. Although they'll still have the autumn festivals to take some time off. And I'm also hoping to get enough gear so we can start a second squad as well. That would certainly be for the best. But until that time, this is what we got. The Boar Bloods. The Fist of Honey Stoker. Oh, and I will also mention that each of our warriors is now equipped with a pair of War Wild Boars. So in addition to those 10 warrior dwarves, we now have 20 War Wild Boars to accompany them, which should help them a tiny bit. I'm hoping. Guess we'll see. We still really haven't seen how effective they are in combat. A damn shame. 
Now, as I had said before, we do have our small army up here in the barracks training, and I'm just going to have them train for a bit in here, because Laura and Bembler are both going to need a good amount of skill with their axes before we have them do anything, just to be safe. But when they do have that skill, I would very much like to send them out to do a little mission. What that would entail exactly, well, I'm not too sure. But we'd be keeping it small here from the start. We have to get a little bit of retribution against those goblins. Bastards can't push us around. Not gonna have it. But anyways, we're gonna let our warriors train for now, get used to their new armor and such, and while they do that, we could take a look at some of our projects we have ongoing. Like up here on the surface, you can see our windmill tower that's coming along, although it's getting to be a bit more complex than I thought it would be originally, much like every project I've ever undertaken. But if we look up, you can see the tower moves upwards level by level, and then curves over this way. And if we continue on up, you can see the different tiers of the tower, which have some branching walkways heading down to the south. And there are a couple different levels like this. Yeah, it's uh, gonna be a mess. A unique mess, a hopefully functioning mess, but a mess nonetheless. We'll peek in again after it comes along a bit farther. We do still have our towers up here on the surface, which we haven't worked on in a little bit, Mostly because the whole Titan attack thing and that siege there really kind of disrupted our work. But I'm hoping to get that continued shortly. Once these towers are completed, our dwarves will have veritable mansions to live in. Which will improve their mood greatly, I'm hoping. I'm thinking it has to be the case. And yes, I am still intending on making this area our future fortress. It just has a bit to go. Looking in here, it seems we have 38 more nether cap corkscrews to make. And then I believe we'll have enough components to get our screw pumps started screw pumps that will of course be used for our magma bridge. Very, very exciting. Now if we move back a bit here into the tunnels behind the bridge, you can see I've designated this tunnel here, which will hopefully lead to our future meeting hall. Quite a ways down, leading through this winding tunnel here, and winds up here, to the area that was originally intended to be Moses' chambers. Yeah, it's all carved out and it's just kind of been sitting here. You can see, um, actually, I never pointed this out, but his meeting hall is a bit, um, muddy. That's why it's brown like this. And you can see there are quite a bit of plants growing in there now. Very unfortunate. I did mention before that we do have a mist generator in there. And the first time I tried it out, it kind of flooded the chamber. Got it all filthy like this. But anyways, as I said, I'm hoping to make this our future meeting hall. I figure it's spacious enough and it's tucked down here in the quartzite caverns, nice and safe. It'd be a good fit, I'm thinking. I figured it's best if we start planning out some aspects of the future fortress. I'd hate to have that magma bridge done and have nothing to protect. That'd be silly. Ugh. Speaking of the need for protection, it looks like yet another vile force of darkness has arrived. The Torment of Witches. Bunch of rat bastards. Anywho, let's see what we have here. Straight off the bat, we can see there's a lot more goblins than usual. Only goblins, actually. A lot of spearmen. And, in addition to the goblins, we also have a pair of beak dogs. Creatures we've not yet seen here in the fortress. It looks like the Torment of Witches is stepping up its game a bit by sending more regular units. Well, I'm not terribly concerned, I suppose. However, one thing I am a bit concerned about is the fact that we do have vampires up on the surface this time. Dwarves who are working on the towers. And some of them are a considerable distance from the fortress, too. Well, I guess the best thing we could do is to just turn on the Autumn Festival and hope for the best. And something I will note too while we're on the screen is that the Boar Bloods are almost fully equipped now with iron armor. Just need a couple shields and they'll be good to go. Very exciting. Although I'm not planning on sending them out after this siege, that'd be foolish. But anyways, the burrow is now turned on, so let's watch these invaders approach. Oh boy, it's an ugly one. Oh, and we have a troll too. Quite a few trolls. Oh yes, this is a proper goblin siege indeed. And a huge one too. Oh boy, this is not good. They are flying for the fortress right now. <laughs> okay, slow your roll there goblins. There's no rush. Down here to the south, carrying a log, we have Imush, one of our first dwarves. I'm hoping she makes it in on time and it looks like, yes, she's good. Okay, thankfully. Get to the fort, Imush. I do not want to lose you. Back up here on the surface, and it looks like the siege has encountered one of our war boars already, and has put it down <laughs> depressingly fast, like no problem at all. And before they get any closer, I'm going to try to close up the entry hall gates. There we go. Well, the far gate is closed, but it looks like a troll got in. Let's get the other gate closed, please. Please? Damn it. Well, it doesn't look like we're going to get that gate closed in time, unfortunately. And so I'm going to cancel this lever pull, just so we don't have anybody smashed in this bridge again. And we're going to send out the Boar Bloods. 
just to take care of this one troll here. Now let's see how this goes. Taking things one step at a time here, and the troll is passing through the gate into the fortress, and the squad should be on its way. Alright, you filthy thing, get the hell away from those statues. Alright, seems to be bypassing the memorial statues, and is instead heading for our war boars here. War boars which again don't seem to be doing any good against the troll. Damn shame. Oh, did you see that? One of the boar bloods down here, Eurist, had just jumped down the ramp after this troll. I like that enthusiasm. And they're moving in. We have a couple boar bloods here, Bembel and Eurist, as well as a war boar, who have now given chase. But it looks like a dwarf was just wounded. Uh, it looks like that was Eurist, who was gored in the foot by one of the troll's horns. Pretty good hit there. But then she did in turn stab the troll in its foot with her spear. Once again, following the troll, who is taking some hits, we can see its bluish blood getting splattered all over the place. No, oh, it looks like the troll has been killed. Fantastic. Killed with a spear to the head by Id Yuristvatsif. Alright, now that that's taken care of, we're going to try to close up our front gate. And it is fantastic, because there are some more trolls moving in. So much quicker than the goblins. Goblins who are still moving in, of course. Well, they're in for a surprise. Because as you can see here, we have refined our trap hall a little bit. We made this choke point around the pressure plate a little bit more narrow, so that anybody passing through this hall has to step on that pressure plate. And that's going to make it all a bit more effective, I think. Now I'm looking back up to the surface because the way to the fortress is now closed, and I just want to make sure nobody's going to get cute with their tactics. We certainly don't need a horde of trolls trying to climb over the wall, or bow goblins shooting down at our vampires. That certainly wouldn't be a good thing. But so far so good from what I could tell, they appear to be fairly content just wandering through the swamps. Which works for us. Having a look around at the fortress now, and the dwarves seem to be in pretty, uh, standard spirits. Just kind of relaxing, doing a little bit of worship in their respective temples. Good to see. And uh, something strange that I will note. Over here we have Atir. Atir Mumaztanam. Uh, she's in the temple to Ifen once more. And I'm pretty sure that since last episode when we saw her praying in here, she hasn't left. Which is a tad bizarre. I mean, I know the burrow is turned on right now, so her choices of things to do are kind of limited, but all of her labors are turned on and there are other things that she could be doing. And you know, even before the burrow was turned on, all she was doing is sitting in this room. Very strange. Right now we can see that she's meditating on the rain, before she was meditating on plants. Well, I guess it does say she is an ardent worshipper of Ifen, dwarven goddess of nature, so it does make sense she'd be worshipping her, but it just seems like so much. I'll tell you what, we'll keep an eye on her for now, and if she's still in here in another month or so, then we'll know something's up. Alright, anyways, having a look back at our siege problem here, and it looks like there is still a fair amount of invaders out there. And so I'm gonna have somebody come down here and pull this lever to reopen our fortress, just like that. And hopefully that'll get the goblins moving back towards our fortress once more. Although it is kind of difficult to see through all this stink here. Probably not for the best. Just be wary, dwarves. Oh, well, it looks like we do have a beak dog already headed towards the fortress. It shouldn't be a problem though because I'm going to try to close up our fortress once more. Yeah, alright, we're closed up, no problem. But it looks like the goblins heard something. What was that? It sounded like the gates. Let's go check it out. Come on in, you bastards. Yeah, there we go. Already starting to do the trick. Now, the last time we used the trap hall, it took about two runs like this. And that was enough to get the rest of the siege scurrying off into the swamp. And so I'm hoping for a repeat. Yeah, here they come, more and more of them. And every single one steps on that pressure plate, which is pretty darn handy. And that looks to have done it. Fantastic. The siege has come to an end. Didn't really take that long either, which is good to see. Maybe about a month and a half. Yeah, not bad at all. That's right, scurry home to the larval castle, and make sure to tell your vile friends about our stinging hallway. Well, vampires, fantastic work. We've successfully put down yet another goblin siege. We'll just give them some time to clear out, and then we'll get straight back to work. And I suppose while we're waiting, we could take another peek in here at Atir, who is in the same exact position she was in. A bit disconcerting. Although, as we can see here, she is in a fairly good mental state. She's not stressed in the least. So I don't think she's losing it. Not at all. But she's still in here praying away. Meditating on fertility now. Truly bizarre. Now the only thing I can think of here is that remember last episode we killed Julasum, the Titan. An ancient force of nature who possibly played a hand in creating the Eternal Realms. Well, seeing as how Atir worships the goddess of nature, could it be that she feels remorse for killing Jalassum? 
I mean, seeing as how the Titan was an ancient force of nature, I would imagine it is somehow linked to Iphen, the goddess of nature, right? In fact, maybe that Titan didn't come here simply to destroy dwarves. Perhaps the great beast sensed a dark taint emanating from Honeystoker, and it was its goal to erase that darkness. Perhaps Atir thinks it would have been better that way. Intriguing. Well, for now, Atir, you can keep praying. Although at this point, she must realize that we've crossed a very dark threshold. That's right, dwarves. At this point, there is no turning back. Ah. Ah. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> hmm. Alright, well, looks like we made a little bit of a boo-boo here. Uh, let's back up a bit. I was working on a new water cistern over here for underneath the hospital, just so we can have a well in the hospital. And, well, it looks like I made a little bit of a mistake in its construction, because now we have water from the brook coming down and filling up our meeting hall. Um, I don't know how this is going to work at all. It's kind of hard to explain what I did exactly, but I had to dig a hole in the floor up this way, just so I could release the water from this previous pipeline. And my intention was to cover it right up after I did that, but I did not. And so now our meeting hall is going to be filled with water from the brook. Now it's early autumn, so we're nowhere near winter, the time when the water freezes very briefly. I suppose the Curse of the Autumn Festival has struck once more. And so we're gonna have to very quickly come up with some sort of a plan here. Well, first of all, I'm gonna have a dwarf come down here and pull this lever, which will stop our mist generator. Because at this point, we have water bubbling up through the floor. And that water then goes through these grates here, feeding the mist generator, which then pours down on top of the dwarves. And that will create a bit of a problem if we allow it to continue. And then next I'm going to designate a tunnel to be dug out, like this right here. It's going to be connected to the bottom of the mist generator water ducts. And the hope is that I can drain water out of the bottom of the meeting hall, down this way here to the bottom of our old well, and then down from there to this level, right above the first cavern layer. And then we can just dump the water down there. This will work, but it's going to take a little bit of doing. And until we can get it done, it looks like we're not going to have much of a meeting hall. Anyways, let's see how this goes. The game is unpaused, and uh, it looks like the water is only very slowly filling up our meeting hall, which is good. It's also probably pretty good that the vampires don't need to breathe, right? That means there won't be any drowning. That's fantastic. Okay, seems like it's uh, filling up extremely slowly, actually. Oh, oh, no, okay, there comes the water. A lot of water. Not good. Okay. Alright, you guys might want to uh, get back up topside or you're going to be underwater very shortly. Alright, down underneath, we do have dwarves at work on those tunnels, although the work is going very slowly. Yeah, keep on working, you guys. We have a ways to go. Ooh, something I just thought of is I locked up these hatches right here. That would really stink if water came bubbling up into the... into the pit here, which it is doing. Oh boy. <laughs> That's not good. Not good at all. Right. I forgot the mist generator needed access down to the meeting hall, and that's kind of how the mist got down to the meeting hall. But it's also the same way that water can get out of the meeting hall. Hmm. Can dwarves work while underwater? Because we're going to have underwater dwarves really quick. Hmm, not good. Okay, I have paused the game once more. <laughs> oh, this is bad. This is really bad. Hmm. <laughs> what to do, what to do. Oh, Nito, I forgot we, uh, <laughs> we didn't open our main gate after that last siege there. And so, it looks like the water is just going to kind of collect in the bottom of the pit. Oh boy, oh boy, that is not fantastic. Well, let's see here. As for options, it doesn't look like we have many of them. And so the new plan is to activate a new burrow dubbed the water burrow for obvious reasons now hear me out for a second the water is filling up the bottom of the pit okay and so my hope is that it will stop at these outer walls here i can get these doors locked up and the water will continue no farther this way down here to the tower of memories will fill up as well but there is a door down here that i can lock as well so it shouldn't be a problem and then after that level fills up it will come up here where we do have more walls and doors which i can lock up hopefully but assuming this all works out, the only things we'll really lose access to are the meeting hall and the bottom of the pit. So it won't be a huge loss. 
Well, all right. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that I took all the animals down here out of their pens. Just to give them a fighting chance, you know? We'll see what happens. <sighs> okay, let's do this. Get to the water, bro, dwarves. We don't have much time. Okay, here we go. The game is unpaused. And it looks like the wild boars and kias are running for their lives. Couldn't blame them. Thankfully, water is not coming into the actual fortress. Just the pit, and that's absolutely fine. But we are going to lose our hives our trade depot, and our memorial statues, which really does stink. Come on, keep running, you damn animals. Keep going, keep -a going. The water is starting to slow down a bit, but it's still coming. We're almost all safe, except for these couple of pigs down here. I decided to just lock the door because I don't want them to drown at this point. And then we do have this one idiot war boar running around at the bottom of the pit. Ugh, you know, I don't want to think it's the case, and I know it's not. But this wild boar is the pet of Stinger. The dwarf was crushed in that drawbridge, and her now submerged memorial statue is still out here. Could it be that the boar doesn't want to leave its side? Probably not, but mm, it's depressing if so. Come on, you pig, I don't want you to die. Go up there, will you? Go ahead, go ahead. There you go. No, stay up there. Don't come back down. What are you doing? I'll keep an eye on it, but I really don't feel good about it at this point. Darn pig. <sighs> now then, here we be. <laughs> the new honey stoker. All right then. First things first, I made a little tunnel into our former food stockpile room, which was a series of rooms, but I have mined it out so it's now one enormous chamber, which we're getting smooth. We need to have a new meeting hall. It's imperative. And if we use these rooms here, then we'll have plenty of access to plants, which we can brew into new drinks. And we also now have access to all our former drinks as well. And also down this way here in the southwestern portion of our living chamber, we have dug out a new tunnel. That leads to a series of tunnels beneath the Tower of Memories and also down to the Quartzite Caverns. Yeah, really, all things considered, I think we made out pretty darn well. We didn't lose any dwarves, and we're still very productive here in the fortress, which is just excellent. Although, I mean, it does still kind of stink. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's some sort of a boon. But certainly not. Hmm. Anyways, everyone's just relaxing now in our nice new gigantic meeting hall getting a drink, getting some more furniture in place. We do have an enormous area now where we can dance. And in fact, I don't really think I'm in a huge hurry to try to drain out the rest of the fortress either. At the moment, all of our needs are filled. So yeah, we're not looking too bad. We are cut off from the surface at this point, and so we can't do any trading or anything with outsiders, which kind of stinks. Only a little bit though. It's not like it was ever that important. And the good thing is that the goblins can't even reach us anymore. So if they do show up, we'll be absolutely fine in the fortress. Although I would much prefer just destroying them with our spike hall, of course. But this is fine too. We can make it work. And now all we'll have to worry about is forgotten beasts coming up from the caverns below. Which is fine, they haven't given us much trouble so far. Which is fine, they haven't given us much trouble so far. And who knows, any others that pop up might just be locked away like the three we currently have down there. Oh, and you know what, while we're locked away, I'm thinking this will be a perfect time to buckle down on our pump stack over here which we are now getting set up. About damn time, right? I know I was saying earlier that I would like to take the boar bloods out and attack the goblins, but things have changed a bit, and I think we should take advantage of this time, although I don't intend to be locked away forever. If this goes on for too long, then I might make an entryway up to the surface. The southern end of our magma bridge is going to be connected up there anyways at some point, and so if we do make an entryway, that's how we'll do it. Oh, and you know, I almost forgot the biggest benefit of this entire situation, and that is that we now have a well underneath our hospital. <laughs> oh my. Was it worth it? Probably. And a good thing it is that the dwarves of Honeystoker got their hospital in order. Because yet another elemental terror has found its way into the winding passages beneath the fortress. Now awoken from its eon-long slumber. This time-forgotten monstrosity has turned its ire against Statarguskash. The forgotten beast with Thona Ditari has come, a gigantic humanoid composed of charcoal. It has wings and it has a bloated body. Beware, it's poisonous gas. Okay, this looks like an ugly one, for more than one reason. First of all, its body is made of charcoal a non-organic material, so that means it could be pretty difficult to break it apart and kill it. On top of that fact, it has wings, which complicates matters a bit, and its worst aspect is the fact that it has poisonous gas. Gas that could greatly affect our dwarves. 
Although, I'm curious if the fact that the dwarves no longer need to breathe will help them in this matter. Very interesting. Well, as we can see here, the beast has appeared up in the northwestern corner of the third cavern lair. And this one, for a fact, can access our fortress. Unlike that skinless porcupine that appeared last episode. Lamifo's the name. And it is very close to this one here. We'll have to keep our eyes open and see if these two get in a scuffle. That'd be fairly interesting. But anyways, yes, I know this beast can get to our fortress. And to complicate matters farther, we do have dwarves down here at the moment. Like this fella here, Cog the Miner, carrying a boulder. Yikes. Alright, so, the plan. We're gonna send all the dwarves to our meeting hall. Just the meeting hall, and that's it. It's quite a ways away from where the beast is right now, and if they can all manage to get in here, then we'll have some time to work with. Although, I'm not feeling so positive about Cog down in the mines there. He might just be too far away. And another thing I was thinking of doing, although I'm not too thrilled about the idea, is possibly sending out the boar bloods. I still have no clue whether that gas can actually affect them or not, because they no longer have to breathe. But I don't know if it'll have an effect if it touches their skin. That might still screw things up a bit. So, ugh. I'm probably just gonna keep them up here for a bit and just see what it does. And if we have no other options, then we'll send them out. Alright, let's do this, dwarves. Get to the meeting hall. And back down underground here, we'll watch Withona Datari move in. Alright, here they come. A little bit slower than I first thought they'd approach. So that, that works a bit. Although it seems like they're making a beeline straight for the fortress. This can't be good. Although something I'm noticing here is they're not flying, which I find rather strange. It does have wings, so why isn't it flying? Well, I mean, to be fair, the beast is made of charcoal, and it has a bloated body as well. Maybe it's having trouble lifting its great bulk off the ground. That would make sense. Yeah, okay, it's taking a while for it to reach the fortress, but it is heading in. Popping in on Cog over here, and she is still making her way for the fortress. Slowly, she's in the quartzite caverns now. Keep it up, Cog. You could do it. Oh, but Wathona Datari is right behind. That is not good. Not good at all. Back over to Cog here, and Cog is headed to pull the lever that is right inside the entryway that leads up to the fortress. And if we can get that lever pulled in time, then it will close that forgotten beast out. Come on, Cog. There you go. Oh, come on. Oh, the beast is moving in. Come on, pull the lever. Pull it. Okay, lever is pulled, and the door is closed, thankfully. I guess we were kind of lucky it spotted those workshops down there, huh? A very close call. But, we're good now, for the time being. However, that does muck up our productivity a bit, because now we can't get wood from the caverns below. But it's certainly better than being smashed by a forgotten beast. Definitely. Well, you bearded bastards, we're starting to approach the end of the episode, so I think we better start wrapping things up. Ah, <sighs> what an eventful episode, huh? <laughs> Honey Stoker now has a pool, unfortunately, but we were able to deal with the problems fairly easily and are back to almost full productivity, except for the fact that we no longer have access to the caverns, which does stink, yes, but not much you could do. We'll have to figure out a solution to this at some point, but I'm not too worried about it at the moment. I should note that at this point, we have made all the nether cap pipe sections and corkscrews that we'll need for our pump stack, and I believe they've all been brought up to the fortress. And so now we're free to work on this project as much as we like. No interruptions. You gotta love it. And it's a good thing too, because we have uh, quite a ways to go on it. Unfortunate. For now, we may be locked away, down underground, held captive by a massive forgotten beast, but ultimately, it will make us stronger. The time that we spend here in the fortress now will be used to build Moses' dream. A dream that must be accomplished. We have to harden ourselves. We must become stronger. As of yet, we've hardly put a dent in the forces of Gugo Ooze Burial. But it will happen. It has to happen. Both for the vampires of Honeystoker and for all the dwarves of the Eternal Realms. We will succeed in our conquest even if it means going against the very forces of nature that bind this world. Blood will flow. Hey you bearded bastards, we're here at the end of the episode today to show off some more fan artwork. And I hope you're excited because we have a couple of real good ones. Our first piece of the day is named Moses, done by Carl the Deranged. And what a spooky piece it is, huh? Damn. Here we can see the bones of Moses, adorned with the enormous black coat that he often wore in life. 
and you can also see here he's holding Uzprausnem, his artifact axe, and he lies here in his tower cap display case for all the world to behold, with what I assume to be his name, just above here, in dwarven runes. Man, I had said it earlier, but it needs to be restated, this is one creepy piece. These colors, ugh, ghastly, wonderful, I love it. The black, the blue, the shading, just terrifying. I mean, Moses was great in life and all, but if I saw this thing down in the Quartzite Caverns, well, I'd be running right the hell out of there, that's for sure. Noble benefactor or not, that thing is terrifying. Beautiful work, Carl, just fantastic. Moving on, we have our next piece of the day, a piece entitled Match Shattered, done by Smiley Master. Match Shattered being the translated name of Usprausnem, Moses' axe. And let me tell you, this is one cool model here. The thing is handcrafted, and it is loaded with details. Man, oh man, how cool is that? I'll tell you, it's really interesting to see one of my drawings done in a 3D model like this. Not something I would have ever expected, honestly. Thrilling. You can see the iron spikes and the jagged iron blade here, crafted eons ago in the very depths of the larval castle by the vile minions of Gugo Ooze Burial. And then down here on the handle, you could see that it's encrusted with rectangular sandstone cabochons. A little farther down, we could see a stylized image of a goblin ascending to the position of Lord of the Cunning Evils. How wonderfully vile. And even underneath the pommel, there's this little design here, which I thought was rather clever. Better than just having it be boring and flat, right? Fan-tastic work, Smiley. Truly impressive. Both you guys, actually, Smiley and Carl, a couple of true craft dwarves. Masterful. And thank you so much. And also a thanks to all you out there for watching. I uh, truly appreciate it, and I really do hope you enjoyed today's episode. And I certainly hope you'll join me next week, here in Stadargus Gosh, Honey Stoker. And until then, you bearded bastards.